or on on the cusp of either because of the isolations it's it's not going to come back in any significant way and it'll just be there underlying or it will be there in a significant way in which case it's going to be incredibly difficult i mean because the, the businesses are open today in london shops are open and you think well okay that's nice you can so it could be like a slow getting back to something like normal and that just takes time or it could be that actually this is completely the start of it being a re respreading or anywhere in between I and mean, there's no I, nobody seems to know mm. I mean, is, is there any evidence of, of in, in the past pandemics as to what might, which of those options might happen? Um, well, medically, um, it's no one really uh, knows on the virology level because it is just, uh, we never had a pandemic of a coronavirus before. And as, as weird as that sounds, because the whole scientific world is at it, the data is not uh, supporting firmly any scenario. It just is guesswork. Right. And er the majority of the virologist expects a second wave in the European winter, in the, in, in the right. autumn. Right. Um, because it has died down rather surprisingly quickly in Europe. Uh, where, never mind how um, quickly and how, you know, how uh, well uh, isolation worked in each country. You know, if you did it like Sweden, or the, which didn't lock down firmly at all, or you locked down like Spain, uh, if you look at the, the graphs for all the countries, basically they fared all very similarly. Mm. And so the, um, the thinking is it must be the climate, the climate that has done something ah. and, the, and the sunshine, we know that it is vulnerable towards UV uh, and that people, uh, if they are outside a lot, uh, they pass it on much less. And there is this thing about vitamin D levels. If they are very high, you get a good ride. So the, the, the levels of vitamin D uh, have a lot to do with the response to the virus, it yeah. seems like. Right. So um, everyone outside uh, and the sun shining uh, is definitely a huge bonus. Um, and no one knows what's happening next because right. the levels of uh, immunity in the, in the population are a complete, so complex and so unknown that no one knows what to do with it. It is really interesting how, <laughs> you know, how something so studied is at, at the same time. So uh, it's too complex. And and you see in 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 China they are just having a you know a tiny outbreak and they're going really bonkers with it, and going into full lockdown again I think, from what I heard, because they so they don't trust it that it is manageable. No, but is that not I thought that they sort of said well the reason for going into isolation for two weeks was because it didn't survive. So if they're worried about it coming back in the winter, then it must be somehow surviving for six months or four months. Oh, absolutely. So how, it how won't does go it... down to, to nothing. You know, New Zealand is the outlier. <laughs> but how, how does it happen? How does it, if, if it dies, if it's just on a surface, the day and it dies and if it's in somebody and it dies after two weeks where how can it survive for four months because it will be uh, somewhere in the world and someone's will spread it on and we're traveling okay 
so it, it, it's just like a, a, there will be these, if you look at the whole globe, you know, there will be these clouds of it going round. And then they will be dealt with as best as any state can. And, um, and then it will slow down again, but it will have already spread somewhere else. And then the, the cloud happens and then it will die down again as best as we can. But I think what most likely will happen is that now we really trying what the British government tried to do in the first place. Uh, count on herd immunity and just really um, an acceptance of very high death levels for the rest of the year. So uh, I think that is because no one can afford the lockdown anymore. No. So we will just die quietly somewhere because it's not even newsworthy anymore. And now we talk about uh, statues and stuff like that. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think, Gary? About How statues. is it over there? There. <laughs> uh, no, no statues have been brought down yet. No, no statues. No. Uh, there's the only statues that are up are from the Sukarno period, post-independence. Anything before that has got long gone. So they're they've already done their per per <laughs> statues. <laughs> done the coal. Yeah. <laughs> we still have Churchills. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, come on, Londoner, Rupert. How do you think about the rioting right-wing footballers, England? <laughs> yeah, there's a wonderful, a wonderful comment in the in the Guardian about the there are these people who are in front of a statue of the man who stopped us having to perform Nazi salutes, it's trying to save the statue by performing Nazi salutes. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, it's just weird. But actually, I, I suspect that it's a bit like you're saying that it's this isn't, it's not really a huge deal. Yes, it's journalism who make the news. And it's something of newsworthy. And it's something for the Prime Minister to be able to talk about rather than have to address the, the, the real issues. So it's much easier to be able to attack um, thugs or protesters than it is to deal with the problems, either the problems that, the, of uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter um, issues or of coronavirus or of the economy, none of which are good things for a prime minister to have to deal with. But if you can stand up and uh, bemoan the um, thugs and be seen as a strong principle, then that's, a, that's good press. So yeah, and a couple of hundred people in London and a couple of hundred fights is, is really, you know, it's, not, it's no big deal. It happens every, every uh, Friday and Saturday night. In London, you know, the, it, it's there is as many stabbings. I mean, there's a, you know, there was a guy shot in Hackney um, two a week ago, young black guy, probably drug related, but he was killed. You know, he was he was shot and killed, and and nobody was killed in these riots um, last week. So, well, how come it is that there's a guy shot and is not on national news? And there's a few bottle, plastic bottles of water thrown and a few Nazi salutes and a bit of graffiti. And a urination. And a, and a urination, yeah. <laughs> so how come that's news? You know, why is that more newsworthy than the... It, it's not. It's, it's just because this is the way that the news is, is massaged in order to you know, create interest. So I don't know. I, I, I think the... The, I think the, there is an interesting aspect to it, and that is about slavery and about how we treat our history. And it's an interesting debate to have as to as to, as to what extent you um, you do consider uh, the difference between what is history and what is 
uh, us um, glorifying and, and a statue tends to glorify you put statues up because you think this this is something worth paying homage to in some way and so for Boris to say that that's you know this is to cover up our history is, is absurd because histories are in museums uh, they're not in the street in general so I, he's wrong um, but it, that's not what's being <laughs> that's not the debate that's happening um, but I it, it is interesting debate I mean that uh, but it, I don't I'm not sure sort of how significant it is uh, we don't we have a I don't, actually I don't even think we have a race problem I'm, I, uh, I know it's been, <laughs> been controversial but there isn't racism can't exist because there is only one race of human beings and it, it, it's 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 actually I, I think it's probably not useful to use racism as a term because it sort of suggests that there are fundamental differences between humans um, and, and there aren't we know they are we know we're all one the same species so it's as far as I can see it's tribalism and it's about, and that, that tribalism is as much nationalism and religious tribalism as it is um, to do with the color of people's skin. And if you recognize it as tribalism, uh, then it, it, it's a, you're looking at it from a different perspective and you're wondering why you belong to different tribes and why you are um, so... Um, antagonistic against other tribes and and it, it sort of has to be learned because I don't think you're born into tribes so it, be, it becomes a cultural thing so it's a sort of like we'd like this because of our culture we are antagonistic towards people who are belong to different tribes because of our culture and then it becomes educational and then it becomes something that you you're looking at it in a very different way anyway that's what i think so that's why i think that just having it as a calling it as a race issue isn't actually helpful and calling it racism isn't helpful uh because I don't, it isn't it's not it's not race it's the wrong word <laughs> well, so you've come over can't come over to my usage I, absolutely. Well, I, I, I've always thought that way, Gary. I've, 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 I've had long arguments with a guy from New Zealand who, who, who was a racist. <laughs> he was, you know, there he is. He was a racist because he would tell me about the different races that there are in the world, and, and I said, well, no, there aren't. They said, oh, yes, there are. Oh, no, there are. No, there are. And it was like, what? You, you know, th this, this is not the case. This is from a scientific perspective we are not different races mm -hmm. and it's because he felt that people who had different characteristics <coughs> physical characteristics belonged to different races it was okay to think of them as people who had uh, fundamental differences from um, the rest of us so that they could be less, they could be less bright. They could be more prone to violence. They could be less trustworthy, and they were all of those things because they didn't belong to the same biological race. And that is incorrect. But it allows you to believe things if you don't understand the science. And which he didn't, even though he's, he's quite a bright man. I mean, he was a, he, he's, he's quite wealthy um, and not stupid, but was not prepared to understand the science or not prepared to accept the science, not prepared to go that far because it would have completely undermined his worldview. I think that is, it is a, the right way of looking at it as a cultural phenomenon uh, and, and in which we are all in, you know, in the same way 
uh, as yeah, you do, yeah, you're just educated into it, and and uh, people on either side believe the same story in the end. Um, and believe, for example, in racism. You know that, and then it then it starts to be a big problem. But it's not that one. Um, on the one side, one of the so-called races would not believe in it and therefore reject it completely and then you couldn't get hold. No, it, it needs always the different sides to all believe in the same story perpetually to to make the whole thing work, actually. Yeah. Mm. So is that taking over from the virus now? I, I don't know. I doubt it. Um, <laughs> and I, it's going to be very difficult to maintain the level of interest, as with any news story. But the virus is with us economically, as well as uh, medically. Therefore, it doesn't matter whether people are dying. The fact is that it's, there are markers in the street from where how far you have to stand apart from people so you're constantly reminded of the virus whereas i don't think we're going to be constantly reminded of black lives matter that that's a difficult thing to maintain um but I, so i the, i don't think the virus is going to go away no i think that's going to be and of course it affects you know people's lives because uh, their lives and their livelihoods um, i was talking to my uh, daughter yesterday she's lucky she works for the bbc so she's you know her job is okay for six months anyway for as long as a contract goes but lots of her friends are in the in the arts and uh, you know, in the theater and of course they have have no work and no likelihood of any work so they're in real trouble mm. um, uh, you just don't know that's a you know, a whole industry has completely been devastated and it, it's it's a it's a not not a particularly stable industry at the best of times but and you know, just you just don't know how on earth people are going to be able to go back to the theater so gary you said it uh, the hospitality is really affected in indonesia as well people don't go to restaurants or is that just a lack of tourists so mm -hmm. there's generally uh, the, the foreign market uh the local market i mean i mean the precautions people are taking out no, not very good, um, and it's a highly densely packed population in any case, most densely populated on Earth in the case of Java. Um, so, you know, whatever you do, it's not going to be the right thing, but, you know, and uh, I think it's just going to keep on continuing like that. But uh, it would be, inter be interesting to see the um, <coughs> political repercussions you know, because uh, this whole US problem has sort of you know, metastasized and sort of found metaphors in, in other countries, uh, just because you know, our news media is completely and utterly dominated by US uh, narratives. Uh, so it's inevitable that uh, other countries are, have um, you know, picked up these same themes. You know, even though they might, might, might not be quite as valid as you know, the, the current US case, for example. Um, but interesting to see how far that will go. Um, and I, I think it may well depend on what happens to Donald Trump over the next uh, six months and whether he even makes it to the election. You've seen all this um, discussion about him perhaps having uh, not Parkinson but some other uh, related uh, neurodegenerative disease. And it, it, Gosh, I no, I haven't seen that. Oh, really? It. Yeah. It's, it's got so it's, it's just classic. It, the, it's, Parkinson's was mentioned. Parkinson's was mentioned, but there was another another one which sounded far more appropriate. You know, a neurodegenerative type of. Uh, uh, disease and people are, are basically, you know, um, 
I guess just, oh, so that's it. It's kind of, we've got this, you know, completely appropriate diagnosis where it, it ticks all the boxes and all that, but, it, but you've got, you know, pretty authoritative people saying it. So, yeah, it's very interesting to see um, what's going to happen just to Donald Trump alone and whether that in itself triggers other um, more underlying problems uh, than just race in the US. It's probably being um, spread by Republican senators, this, this, um, this rumor, because uh, they, I think they're very worried about the, their position, because if, I mean, the, the way the polls are looking at the moment, the way his, his approval rating is slowly uh, dying down, they could have a, a whitewash in, a, in the election. They could lose lots and lots of seats, the Republicans. Mm -hmm. It could be quite devastating for them. And um, there's going to come a tipping point where they just think, is, is supporting Trump um, just too much of a liability? Whereas if we change him, then our nomination for president before the election, and we have somebody we can put somebody else there. It's not going. We might still lose, but it's not going to be as devastating. And if you think of, you know, they're not. They've never really liked Trump. He's never been a Republican, as in terms of the politics. So you, you just you've got to think from their perspective. How how long am I prepared to support this? I mean, no, they're they're actually saying, well, I'm, we don't read what he says. We don't read what the President of the United States, the leader of the Republican Party, we don't read what he says. I mean, I think, what? Well, that's a very strange reaction. And, the, and so they, they refused to talk to journalists about it. And that must, that must be quite unusual. So it's not, they're not, it's gone from a state that we will support him no matter what he says, to a state now of, we, I'm not going to even comment on what he's saying so I don't have to say whether I support him or not now that that intellectually for you as you do you're thinking that you must be thinking how long am I prepared how long can I be in this situation and if the Republicans decide they're not going to support him then they don't he, he will no longer be the Republican nomin nominee for uh, and maybe you know this ties in very with with what you've just been saying you know, that, that's a very good excuse for saying, yeah. oh, the, the guy's perfectly, you know, we perfectly attuned with him, but um, he's ill. We, we, mm -hmm. And of he course he doesn't... Step back. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering what the unconventional loss of power in, in one super state will have on other states, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, domino type effects in, in other countries from people who are basically following the, the US narratives, even though they might not completely fit into, the, into their local narratives or mm -hmm. the local problems, and, and causing other unconventional loss of power in other countries, including, I might add, China. Ah, yeah, China is very interesting. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so you know, China breaks apart, they, they'll, so there's going to be problems. In China, what? China? Did you say China? No. Yeah. Oh. It could, but on the other hand, I mean, Germany was split into two different countries for a long time, and then almost overnight, it wouldn't. It wasn't, and it became a united country. So you think you know that happened very quickly, and. So I'm not sure, I think, but I think you're right. I think China is very interesting as to how long you can maintain that regime. It's surprising it's gone on this long. Mm -hmm. But once you've well, started um, to open it up to sort of into private enterprise and capitalism, and, and, uh, it's, it's difficult to maintain a communist regime. I mean, because they are conflicting ideologies as much as anything else. I don't think anybody seriously calls them sort of communist anymore without talking. You know, well, I think they do. You know? 
Uh, it's, not, it's, a, it's certainly a totalitarian state. Yeah. Uh, but you know, putting labels like and this is a, a communist totalitarian state and this is a, a Nazi totalitarian state. There's not a lot of difference when you come down to it. When you get down to totalitarian states, yeah. it doesn't matter what excuse they use. That's only the narrative for the populace, isn't it? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's the important thing, that it is the narrative for the populace. And if it is if the narrative is becomes a complete illusion, then and everybody is thinking, well, we're living this illusion, then the illusion can fall. So yes, you're right, that it is a totalitarian state and the, the pretend ideology doesn't doesn't matter to the people in charge it matters to the people who are living through it because you have to maintain that you have to maintain a, some sort of level of belief and if and coherent if, coherent illusions yeah yeah <laughs> and, if, and if the illusions disappear and you can no longer believe in it then you can no longer believe in the regime and you sort of wonder okay. why are we why are we in this? Uh, well, that's that's that is the problem for China. I think they the the, the regime worked for so long because they can go back to Confucius, can't they? Because there's this good government, this kind of kindly king or oligarchy or so that knows best anyway, and so no one could do a better job than them. They're very. Um, uh, they're very right and and honorable and just do the right thing all the time and I think they could dine out on that a long time and they delivered and and but it is it it, it is vulnerable towards things like this bloody virus now because if they are seen not to have done the right thing and it hasn't come out uh, right and it uh, then uh, that whole that that whole edifice can tumble i think it is surprisingly vulnerable towards completely random things like that i think yeah would you would you agree with that or i would i would i, I think there have been lots of I, I haven't read the book but i came across a book which talked about this in, in the 1990s written in the 1990s and it was a, by an economist who pointed out the number of times when apparently solid structures collapsed almost overnight because they were held up by an illusion um, and it was just a collective exception accepted belief and once that illusion cracks and people just don't sort of wake up to think well why why is it like this and it doesn't need to be like this. And it, then it's the emperor's new, new clothes. And mm. I mean, they, they, we sort of all recognize at the same time, actually, well, this is, doesn't have to be this way. And, and we've all, you know, we don't accept it. And, I, and it can just, yeah, can just fall apart. And it happens quite a lot. So, yeah, why wouldn't it happen? It's, it's sort of more difficult to think how China survives with, con containing that regime with that many people. Well, it's a security state, so a huge amount is spent on surveillance. Yeah. But you know, it's, yeah. it's difficult, isn't it? You think, you know, the amount you've got to invest yeah. in order to maintain that is, yeah. is, is phenomenal. And, mm -hmm. and there aren't many, well, there aren't any instances where that type of regime has survived for, what's the longest? Soviet survived, what, from uh, 20s through to 50s of 30? Maybe, maybe well, 50 years. Now, it's 70 years, really, hasn't it? From yeah. the 1920s to... 1990s but they never were that good on surveillance uh, the, the eastern germany was star of surveillance yeah. Yeah. and uh, you know you can see that you know in in the when it all fell down that i don't know 
at some an extraordinary amount, not quite half of people, but you know, an, am an amazing amount of people were actually part of the surveillance team. Because um, everyone spied on, on the other half. Uh, it, and, and that wasn't, that, that didn't survive very long either. In the end, it got, it just got unwieldy, it couldn't be processed anymore. But then that was before algorithms. And and it, but it got too expensive. Maybe China is in a, in the same situation that it just can't quite keep it up anymore. Well, what, you know, but they've got one and a half billion people. I mean, it's 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 <laughs> a lot. To it's look a on. lot. To... It's a lot. To look... <laughs> <laughs> and you, when you you know you're having to work globally, if you were only concerned with that, I mean, Eastern. East Germany, because it was in a different sort of you know, empire, it belonged to the Soviet empire, and it was in a way being constrained and a big wall you know, and, and very little movement between. But when you open up the borders, when you become, you have to become more flexible and more mm -hmm. global, then it, it's going to get increasingly difficult to, to maintain the illusion. Um, yeah. And I, I so. So yeah, I but I agree with you, Gary. I think it's it's it's. I don't know how long and whether to put money on it. That would be just uh, my betting instincts come in to think of well, <laughs> how long are these? Going? But I think it's is an interesting bet on Donald Trump as to whether he will become the nominee. At um, mm -hmm. it's probably more interesting than whether he would win because I don't think he he'll win the election if he stays there. Pretty sure that's not so that. what has changed then? What do you both think about that? Because he's, he's been talking rubbish for four years, you know. So what what is it in the end that suddenly makes him go down in the rates? Is it the economy? Is it really that bloody simple? Yeah, I think probably. For most Americans, I think. I, I didn't know much about Americans, but I've sort of learned a bit more about them over the last month or so because they've because there's, there's been so much. Because you just think, well, why would you support it? But then why would you support Boris? And a lot of the reasons people supported Boris was, was because they didn't want to support Hillary. And also I read that there's a lot of white males and probably white females who were fed up with the idea that they'd had eight years of being run, in, run by a black man. So they, they quite wanted a white man in charge. But a lot of it was that they didn't like Hillary. And a lot of Boris was a lot of people didn't like um, Jeremy Corbyn. And they, that's why the, he, he got in. So it's, he sort of got in a bit by default. After all, he, you know, he didn't win the, 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 the national vote, the popular vote. It was three million short. So he, he sort of got in by the skin of his teeth. And a bit like Boris winning the referendum, I don't think he expected to do it. It was just a publicity um, I don't know, mm. point of view. So, but once you've committed to something, once you voted for somebody, once you've said, yes, that was something I did, it's difficult then to renege on it. And it, it, it's only, it takes time. But there was a, it was quite an illuminating um, interview with three, <laughs> big sample of three. Um, voters who voted for Trump last time and they asked them would you vote for them again and, one, and a woman would say absolutely yes he's absolutely the right person and I was absolutely right the first time and absolutely right the second time another woman was saying yes pretty much he's doing what we wanted him to do and there was a bloke who was saying I voted for him before but this is you know he's obviously he's done a lot of things that are wrong and he said a lot of things that are wrong he didn't say he'd made a mistake in voting for him but he he could see a change and it, it only takes a, a fairly small percentage of people who voted for him last time to not say they're going to vote for him again or for for them not to vote for him again for him not to be able to get to the 45 percent that he that he needs um and so I suspect there just aren't the situation, the, 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 the perfect storm that there was, which allowed him to get in last time, just isn't there. So it's not that he's going to lose, that he, he should have lost last time. 
and it was just circumstances that meant that he won. Mm. I think that, that you know the, the the bits that I've read to sort of suggest that. So it seems that's why it seems so unlikely that he'd win again, because he'd have a lot of things. And Joe Biden is just such a a, a sort of a non person <laughs> that you just can't you know hate him like people hated Hillary. So there's no there's no reason why you wouldn't vote for Biden. There's nothing you know you can just think. Well, yeah, he's he's he isn't going to do us any harm, and he's probably going to be all right. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't I vote for him? I can think of a few reasons why people wouldn't vote. Ah, well, I wouldn't vote at all. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, but that in a way that's sort of okay, um, so long as there aren't too many of them. Because well, one the problem thing, is there was there was fifty percent in the U.S. last time didn't vote of eligible voters. Was it fifty percent? Fifty percent of eligible voters didn't vote. Ah. So so Trump got in with twenty five percent of the, the the American electorate. It was probably even less than that because he, he, he yeah. but yeah, probably about, in that case about twenty four percent. But yes, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe the. Black Lives Matter will motivate her people. There's been talk of an enormous numbers of people um, registering uh, to vote. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. And maybe that they... make the difference. People actually caring and voting. But the, but the problem is, do they have the candidate? And Biden, yeah. you know, he's just really nothing. And well, he's just, but that's he's the point. The it's, world. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. It, Mm. And it'll be also quite interesting to see who his running mate is, because uh, if this woman Harris, the black woman, that that would be motivating for a lot of people. Um, yeah. Maybe <laughs> de <laughs> demotivating, given and demotivating given Biden, for others. <laughs> yeah, given Biden's age. Uh, so. mm -hmm. But you know, I, I'm I'm. I would I would have a bet on Trump not winning. I need the odds, and it's just not worth it now. I should have put it on earlier. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. It was only about two weeks ago that mm. uh, he was still favourite, but he's dropped dramatically in the betting. So you know the virus does funny things, huh? In I mean, isn't that isn't that amazing how? what we're going through is influencing the whole globe in totally in thing in, in ways that cannot be anticipated it's it's uh, the, all that that complex structures that are all interdependent and you throw something like that in and everything adapts but makes an, a, a, a shape a new shape uh, that, so everything else has to adapt as well and it just makes a different globe everywhere. It, it's, I, I'm just fascinated by it. The narrative more than the actual happening. Mm. Because if you, like Rupert, you said before, you know, if, you, if you see what risks we take into, um, into our ways every day, going out, driving our cars, uh, the amount of people dying on our streets, people dying in famines all around the world. Uh, it's, it, it goes into insignificance what the virus has done so far. But our story about it is just different. And then from that story, every other story has to adapt as well. Mm. Is it like that? Yeah. It is. I mean, I, I, I wrote something. We have a little family, my, uh, my generation with my two brothers and one of, the, one of my brother's sons who are quite old. And they, it, well, they're all very interested in politics. So we have a little um, uh, email group where we talk about these things. And I, I was... There's some very interesting... Some of them are involved sort of quite heavily in... in advertising and so on and I I was I've been quite intrigued to see how their 
perceptions of this have affected other ways of seeing the world, other, other, um, how it sort of permeated into areas of thought which you wouldn't have ex perhaps expected it to. But I think you're right. It, it's it has it is extraordinary. I I wrote that because I thought how many people have actually died of this, and are that what what's it comparable to? And so far we've had well about between somewhere between forty and fifty thousand people um, in Britain die of coronavirus, and every year in Britain seventy seven thousand people die of um, smoking smoking related Ill illnesses and half a million are <clears throat> um, hospital um, treatments are smoking related so in terms of the the number of people more people will it'll probably be about the same this year the number of people who die of smoking so why don't you ban smoking why don't we ban smoking because you think of the number of people who die and then the, the number of how much the NHS has to invest in keeping people alive because of smoking. And clearly it, the, the answer is because it's a choice. You don't, you don't choose to die of, um, I presume this is the answer that you don't, you know, you don't presume you don't choose to die of Corona, but you, you can choose to commit suicide by smoking. So sort of an interesting thought, but, um, but on the other hand, with coronavirus, we were locked up for two months uh, in our own homes. And that was a, a law for everybody except Dominic Cummings. But it, we were all told and we would be fined. So that was a law that was passed very quickly to stop our choices, to stop my choices of going to the cinema. The cinemas were shut down, so I can't go to the cinema. So that's a choice that's taken away from me. So why is it not okay to take away the choice of smoking when it it kills people and and kills a lot of other people because of the amount of NHS time and effort that goes into treating people with smoking illnesses could well go into treating people with other illnesses that aren't smoking related and they would keep those people alive so you're killing people by smoking in the same way that you're killing people through coronavirus by going outside and potentially spreading it But it's not a debate. It's not in the news. Nobody talks about it. Nobody's at least bit interested in this. And yet, statistically, it seems to me to be quite comparable. So what you're saying, yeah, in terms of people dying from all sorts of other things, from famines, and you know, those things are not important. But coronavirus is important. Coronavirus is important. And it seems to be to do with the nature of governments having to, to do something about it. And it's so it becomes political. How, how is it then, Gary, in Indonesia? Are people afraid of it or do they not care? It's, is it, uh, do they just care because there's no tourists? Or are, is it is a matter of, of um, fear in the population? I think there, there is a certain amount of fear, I think. Um, th but there's also an awful lot of just plain ignorance. So, you know, uh, government communications are imperfect at best in, in, a, in a population as large as this. Um, and a lot of people don't get the message. Um, or a lot of people just think, you know, oh, God will protect me. A lot of people think that. Um, so yes, the, the compliance is you know, good for some people, but mostly bad. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know, I can't, I can't, ex I can't really see anything sort of improving anytime soon with, in terms of total deaths. But uh, I noticed that they stopped releasing uh, figures from the cemeteries. Um, so that you know, journalists could, could track the actual numbers of people dying from COVID by the by the, dim, the difference in numbers of people being buried every every month. 
Uh, but now those figures don't seem to be as available as they were uh, on the, <laughs> two months ago. That's so now, one way of dealing with it. <laughs> so, so the only figures that, that we get are, are figures that are just you know, straight out of hospital saying, oh, this, we've got this, this many patients today and uh, we discharged this many and this many died. I mean, hospital statistics will tell you nothing in, in a situation like this in a country like this. Uh, the only statistic that really can, can really be relied upon in this sort of, sort of circumstance is the total death as a consequence of, uh, of the epidemic. And generally in Jakarta, it was discovered that about 25 percent over and above previous year, previous months. So, you know, instead of 3,000 deaths per month in, in this particular area in Jakarta, you've got 4,000 deaths. That's pretty significant. You know, that's that, that's a, a big increase in the death rate. But I'm surprised that other governments don't do the same thing. Why just announce COVID cases, which mean nothing statistically, and, and uh, announce, you know, average, you know, Total, total deaths for, 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 for the month in comparison with previous months and previous years. <coughs> that tells you a lot more about a pandemic than, than uh, you know, hospital diagnoses. Yeah. yeah. But no, they don't want to do that. There's a good reason for it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and you can see the sense for the regime to just lock down on the numbers because it is so destabilizing. Yeah. Well, yes. I mean, at the end of the day, they just have to shrug their shoulders and say, you know, we're actually not in control. <laughs> in fact, yeah. you know, it, the, the illusion of management. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, they can't really do that much. So they just have to let it run wild. What, what it's going to do, it's going to do. I think that's probably the most interesting thing about this is that illusion of control is that we are I don't know how much in a, in a I, I suppose a, a sort of generally a free democratic country which we we think Europe is or countries which we think Europe how much we how much we have a sort of belief in that level of government control and how much we think, do we really think it's a control? But maybe that is an interesting debate, which, which will come up is to, cause I, you do, you don't, well, I don't say we don't, I don't think I haven't sort of thought about it. You just accept this is life. I'm going through life. It's not particularly bad. It's a lot better than it's been in the past. Things are okay. And I have a reasonable um, lifestyle and you can do pretty much what you want. So you don't, it doesn't sort of feel as though I require high levels of control and, and would prefer if there weren't too many high levels of control. I, love the idea of a health service. I think that's wonderful. And that, that there is a welfare state. That's you know, wonderful things. Other than that, you just sort of, it makes you sort of wonder. And, and the education is great. There's, a, there's free education up until the tertiary level. But you'd, I don't tend to have to think about the level of control above that as we've been presented with with this with coronavirus and that people trying to deal with something at a, a a national level and and doing it pretty appallingly <laughs> it was, uh, and and then all of that being presented through the news media as be, as as the pattern of how it's being done and it's that that grinds, but that because it grates rather, because you just think, well, it's just not, it's, it's not, this doesn't ring true. 
we're being presented with a very detailed, very, very precise and, and a very massaged view. And I just wonder whether lots of people will start to think that way. You just think, well, this, you know, we are being presented with what you think we ought to be presented with. And, and, and that, that's the illusion. And this is, and how long can you maintain that illusion? Mm-hmm. Well, they're not doing a very good job of it at the moment. <laughs> it's a difficult thing to do. And you, you know, you've got to have lots of things in place to maintain it. And the, I don't know, it's, it's very, it just makes you wonder how things will change over time. And it's what Elfie was saying. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting position to be in. And all, it is unique, isn't it? I mean, when has this ever happened before that we've all been involved in the same thing? Well, I, I remember back in the 12th century. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't actually remember. But I've, been, I've, I've heard from, from impeccable sources you know, that, uh, that I think it was uh, post uh, the Black Plague in, in Europe, you know, the, the wages of, uh, of serfs uh, and the conditions under which they worked improved dramatically. So there was a you know, mm. huge labor, labor shortage uh, in all the, yeah. little, the little fiefdoms around the place. And for the first time in their lives, the little priests had to had to beg serfs to come work for them. Uh, so it, it greatly in, in improved the bargaining power of, of, a, of a, you know, a huge class of people. Um, you know, virtually, you know, well not overnight, but you know, over, over a period of one or two years, um, completely changed social relationships uh, you know, throughout a, a continent. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know. You can ride the pandemic, like you can ride a wave, I guess. Uh, but you know, there's lots, lots of other people on that surf too. Not just good guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd... It's too, yeah, there's lots of so <laughs> lots and lots of very interesting. Um, ideas or, or yeah to come out of this like thoughts and as to how things might go mm-hmm. a, a, a period of reflection which has perhaps not not happened not in, not in my lifetime no that doesn't seem to happen at all huh? if you think i i i, I I just said because it just came to me. If you look at it, you know, so we got the regimes like China, uh, which is just utter control and surveillance, and they do it like that. And then what happened in the last uh, four years in in Britain and America is that people came to power who were ahead of the news story all the time. So they they um, controlled. Uh, the media, this thing that you either have to clamp down and have total control over because you say who is doing social media in your country. Uh, They control it by giving them new things, new news every day, like the tweeting. This is making the agenda by just always giving the next impetus. So you're always ahead and ev- the news media can't help but zone in on you and you're winning because you're always the most shocking. So you, got, you always deliver the next news story yourself and therefore you guide it where you want it. And in, the, in, in Britain that has happened with the Brexit agenda and, and Johnson has won it because he did something very similar there. He was just on the front foot all the the time. So he led by being quicker and more drastic and more more newsworthy than everyone else. And and look how that comes down by a pandemic, which by itself, you know, randomly is 
the most, the biggest news story, and not even a Trump or a Johnson can compete with a bloody pandemic. And so the whole media is suddenly taking their eye off these guys and looking there. And then they don't look so good because they can't make the agenda anymore. The pandemic is the agenda. And suddenly they just respond to it. And then guess what? They get it wrong in, in the response. And suddenly it allows that, that whole belief and that whole thing of every, everyone's eyes on Boris, everyone's eyes on Trump uh, doesn't work anymore because our eyes are averted by a natural phenomenon. And, um, and they just don't look so good then suddenly. And no matter how they want to get the story back, they can't because it's the death numbers that are or you know, the, the lockdown, uh, it's, it's the economy struggling with it. It's a whole different news story. And now it's black deaths, black lives matter, black deaths matter actually. And so the whole, and they can't control the narrative anymore that they did so well before. And the whole Cummings edifice doesn't work. He's, he's depowered. It, it only works if you are writing the news story. And he can't at the moment. It must uh, even be. more interesting when he became the news story as well. Yeah. That was fine, you know. <laughs> that, I, I'm sure he likes it and he did it very well. But it, it's only a temporary relief. I mean, he, he was a, you could see his mastery in there, in, in how he did this. And the whole, the media fell for it, Klein and Sinker. So he holds it, he holds the, the, the story back seeds lots of untrue stories with the true story. The untrue stories are even more uh, uh, horrid than the real one. And then he can sit in front of the media and say, well, you got it wrong here, there and there. And, and so what I really did is not really that important and newsworthy. And it worked. So he yeah. depowered by, again, being ahead, being more shocking, and then saying... Um, well, that's a, that's a very interesting analysis. I, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure that it wouldn't have had a more dramatic effect if it weren't for the, the Black Lives Matters that has taken control of the, of the, the, the media. Because I, th I think, and I... I I think it might still be there. I don't think it's going to go away. For me, it, it was a, a point a bit like Black Wednesday for uh, John Major. And also it was a bit like um, when Gordon Brown didn't call an election. Um, both those incidents at the time were dramatic. They were very newsworthy and then they went away, but they never went away they were always underlying and undermining the, there was something that people accepted as being a fact. And a bit like last time I voted for you. Okay, well, I voted for you last time. It's gonna take a long time for me to forget that. This is something that's gonna take a long time to, for people to forget. Yeah. And I think it's been a real problem. And I, so I, I yes, he, he tried to ride it out as best he could, but I don't think that this is going to go away. I, it's just something that will be under the surface. The, 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 the big problem is it's shown as that you told us to do one thing, but you did something else. And that level of hypocrisy is difficult to make disappear, no matter how clever you are. So I suspect he's done a huge amount of damage. And, and why didn't Boris just sack him and then reinstate him a couple of months later, like he did with Pretty Patel? There must have been a good reason for keeping him there. And I think it's what you were saying is that you need somebody to be able to massage the media. And you couldn't afford to get rid of him because they're going to go through Brexit, which is <laughs> another fucking disaster. And you need somebody to manage that to keep putting out those stories, just like you were saying. And he's the only one that can do it. Because the rest of them, I'm 
got you know, any, any sense of how to manage the media. So I think, I think you're right, but I, I, I think that he has done more damage. I don't think that story is going to go away. The, the eye test is just too much. That's just, <laughs> it's just such a good line for anybody. So I'm just going to go and test my eyes by putting a small child in the back of the car and driving around. It's just so crazy. Ah, oh, hey, what an amazing time to live in, I think, really. Absolutely. Uh, because I I really think that this is like chaos therapy, the theory, <laughs> you know, you just, I have <laughs> no idea of where this is, what, what, what's next, because uh, there all sorts of reshuffling is happening. So, Gary, what, what happened to, in the company? You had to let go of so many people. How how has that influenced every everything? Um, the first thing I did was, was well, I put up about I sacked about four people initially, just because they were expendable and they, they weren't bringing any benefit to the company and. Uh, long track record and corruption and that sort of thing. Um, so you know, that was easy. Um, and the rest, well, I sort of used a lifeline model where I sort of threw them overboard but threw them a line at the same time. Oh. So basically they're getting a, a minimal sort of monthly you know, wage, if you want to call it that. Probably barely enough to eat, that's about all. Um, that's all that can be done. So, yeah, I, I haven't actually sacked them, but uh, it may come a time. I mean, I, the, the economy isn't improving. Like I said, it's, it's, it's a dead cat bounce. It's going to go down a lot further, and I'm, I'm not going to have any choice. I'm going to have to cut, cut a few more off. We're going to be a, a good deal more difficult to do. Oh, bless oh you. That, that's, that sounds amazing. To, to kind of, you know, lighten the load, but with a lifeline. That sounds amazing. It's the best that can be done. It's not, you know, certainly not, not what I would have liked to have done, you know. In the very fact that they feel that they've been thrown at the board is, you know, a, um, yeah, it's, it's a blow psychologically. Mm. Oh. That would probably last a lot longer than the, the lack of money, that, that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. This is an interesting time at the moment because you know today the shops are open in the UK and there's this kind of you, if you listen to the media it's like it's all suddenly oh we we're out of it basically you know <laughs> no no, <laughs> no. <laughs> that's really not that's the point it's so little and yet there is wild enthusiasm and and uh, uh, and um, optimism about what that would mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there could be a good deal of support for for the the herd immunity uh, strategy. Yeah. Um, just because it would mean, you know, lifting all the lockdowns and just taking the blow and uh, moving on with it. Yeah. And that, that sort of, you know, obviously that, that, that's a polar opposite to, to, a, to a lockdown, um, which, you know, I think most people would agree is that these lockdowns are, are going to cause more deaths ultimately uh, than they're actually killed directly by the virus. I think that's, um, I think most people would accept that that's what's going to happen. So I guess what, what actually happened in the West was you know, we had uh, the medical establishment panic, as you know, they should in these circumstances. 
uh, but then perhaps applied a, a medical solution rather than a sociological solution. Um, I mean, the site, you know, to, to have a, um, a modern developed country like Britain, you know, okay, we can argue about that, uh, you know, confronting a, um, you know, a scenario where you know, people are actually dying outside of hospitals quite literally, uh, those sorts of scenes are pretty ugly. Uh, but are they any uglier than a sort of, who knows, 10 times more people who are going to die much more slowly over the, over the next couple of years because of that, um, you know, because of lockdowns and things. Yeah. So I just wonder whether, it's, you know, whether this is really a medical decision. You know, this is uh, a bit more than that. I don't suppose I'll make myself popular with that opinion. Either, so. No, I mean, I think <laughs> it's, I think that there are alternatives though. I mean, I think the, the oh. point, the point was that, yeah, there were things. It wasn't as if this wasn't predicted. Yeah, well, that's the first thing. And a lot of people are saying, you know, the people who knew about it said, yeah, this could well happen and this is what you've got to do in order to prevent it. And you have to put all of these things in place. And if you do that, then you can probably contain it. But that's none, nobody did that. Nobody prepared that other than perhaps. I think, I don't know, I think South Korea, South Korea did that. Yeah, and yeah, because they'd had, they had SARS, didn't they? And so they sort of knew what yeah. was likely was going to happen. Yeah. And Koreans are highly, highly organized. I mean, yeah. they're obsessively organized. So when, when there's a, when the state, I mean, they certainly have their, their internal conflicts, but uh, when they unite, they're, they're, they're monsters. <laughs> they're, they're, uh, Highly, highly focused. But I can't see that working elsewhere. You know, even in Japan, I don't think that sort of approach could work. So the very few countries could have made that sort of determination and have the you know, almost the entire society sort of you know lockstep immediately. And it's not just because they trust their government, because they don't. But uh, you know, I think there's enough um, uh, tribal unity and, and, and sort of a tribal, a level of tribal trust, which, which says, you know, okay, this time this is the right thing to do. We're not going to disrupt it, which is not often the case in South Korea. You get quite, uh, you know, the, the democracy there is sometimes rather robust. I think in this, in, in the, the, like in, in the UK, what will happen is that uh, the, the, indeed they go back to plan A, which was to uh, let herd immunity grow. So opening up things to a certain extent and try to keep it out of the young population and let the old ones die in the care homes as they have already done. Basically, that was not prevented. I think it is. it was taken into account, if not something more sinister. So that was just accepted, tolerated that that would happen and uh, that will carry on. Basically, that will now, so as, as the, the, the economy will be opening up, because it has to, but they will keep banning any mass con gatherings among uh, under, under 70 year olds, basically. They don't want the virus to cause havoc there, because that's not good for approval ratings. Yeah. And that, that does other harms. Uh, but all the vulnerable and the elderly, they got to look after themselves, basically. They have to self-isolate, they have to shield, and that will not get lifted. And if someone who can't stand it anymore comes out of their shielding, it's their, their fault, basically. Mm -hmm. So the, everyone will wash their hands of them, you know. If, mm -hmm. Well, what do you expect if you're vulnerable? Just lock yourself yeah. away, you know. We even send you a food parcel. So it's, 
it that that is what will so they want a, a lowish level of infection in the normal population that that they can just about deal with and with the vulnerable ones they expendable and so we will get to to uh, tolerate these hundreds of deaths every every day just like we do at the moment i mean yeah. 200 deaths uh, uh, eight weeks ago that would have been disaster now it's, it's, mm -hmm. it doesn't even appear in the news anymore you know it's mm -hmm. a, it's a that's a that's a positive yeah. <laughs> you know 200 deaths look at that we're doing mm -hmm. well and they will be all be in in care homes and they just wipe out that whole generation basically yeah i'm i'm not quite so <laughs> i'm not <laughs> quite so sure that this is going to be acceptable i think that after a while once the initial impact has happened and we live through it then there's a time of reflection and then there's a time of of less news less obvious in your face news and then the journalists start looking for news and when they start looking for news it'll be like well how did how did this country do compared to other countries hmm. and when that and that starts to permeate and unless something else happens and that becomes something that people start thinking about for goodness sake this country was the third worst in the world and you think, and that once that becomes yeah. a storyline then you think what He's gone yeah he will you know, and he will uh, it's like blair i i'm sure he won't recover from it and yeah. he will always be the one under whose watch this was the, uh, one of the worst affected countries in, in on the globe absolutely it's like blair and and the iraq war uh, britain is worse than uh, statistically uh, than, than america and you think what the percentage of people dying in britain is more than the percentage of people so we're worse than the how trump has managed it that's just wow oh. And, and that is not yet a news story, but it will become one when it there is less become. news I'm, because, I'm, you know, yeah. people will have something, they have, have something to write about. Yeah, I agree. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I, He's had it, basically. I think he knows too. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, he wanted to be the knight in shining armor with Brexit and all, you know, right up into the rosy future. It's all lost. It, poor boy. <laughs> <laughs> that will never happen. Never will I say, poor boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, tragic. It is tragic. Yeah. Oh, well, wow. See, I like these meetings better than the big ones, I think, where everyone <laughs> says where they are. And, and that's basically because I only say rubbish in situations like that. It really doesn't bring the best out of me. <laughs> so I got more of a chance with you, mainly by listening, keeping my trap shut. <laughs> oh, that's been delightful, but now I have to go. Yeah, yeah. yeah me yeah. too. Oh. Yeah, and even I've got things to do. Yeah. And I'm really proud of you. I love the lifeline, darling, Gary. That yeah, that's brilliant, Gary. Really, yeah. Wow, that's Dharma in light, huh? Yeah, well, I'm, I might have still cut, cut a few off, but anyway. It's, it's, <laughs> at least I've got them organized to some extent. Oh. Know what's going on. So we'll wow. see what happens next about one or two months. That will probably really determine what happens. Mm. Well, good luck. Okay. Good luck to you. Good to see you all again. Yeah, it's you. been brilliant. And you. See you again next oh. week. Yeah. Bye-bye. Okay.